Hello and welcome to Lifelong Learning with Fulvia. My name is Fulvia Fiorani. In today's lecture, we will stay within our solar system and take a more detailed look at our planets, dwarf planets, and other solar system bodies. We will start with some general information, then cover more specific details. We will start our general information with defining the various solar system bodies. Then we will talk about how our solar system formed and briefly mention planetary motion. Then we'll take a closer look at each individual planet and some of their moons. Additionally, we will highlight a few of the spacecraft missions to the planets. We then continue with dwarf planets and finish with other solar system bodies to include trans-Neptunian objects, asteroids, and comets. Until 2006, there had been no official definition for the various solar system bodies. In August of 2006, the International Astronomical Union defined three categories of solar system bodies. A planet is a celestial body that is in orbit around the sun. It has sufficient mass for its self-gravity to overcome rigid body forces so that it assumes a nearly round shape and it has cleared the neighborhood around its orbit. In other words, it has become the gravitationally dominant object in its orbit. The eight planets, of course, are Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. A dwarf planet is a celestial body that, just like a planet, is in orbit around the sun, it too has sufficient mass for its self-gravity to overcome rigid body forces so that it assumes a nearly round shape. However, it has not cleared the neighborhood around its orbit. In other words, it is not the gravitationally dominant body in its orbit. By definition, this is really the difference between a planet and a dwarf planet. And of course, a dwarf planet is not a satellite of any of the other planets. There are currently five dwarf planets, Pluto, Ceres, Eris, Haumea, and Makimaki. But other known objects might be reclassified as dwarf planets in the near future. All other objects except satellites orbiting the sun are referred to collectively as small solar system bodies. These objects currently include asteroids, most trans-Neptunian objects, comets, and other small bodies. Now, according to these definitions, Pluto does not qualify as a planet because it has not cleared the neighborhood of its own orbit. Pluto is now classified as a dwarf planet and is recognized as the prototype of the new category of trans-Neptunian objects. Our solar system formed 4.6 billion years ago as a massive cloud of interstellar gas and dust called a nebula, from the Latin word for cloud. Now, due to its own self-gravity, or the shock wave from a neighboring supernova, the cloud started to gravitationally collapse while slowly rotating. As the cloud continued to collapse, its rate of rotation, or spin rate, increased. In physics terms, this is called the law of conservation of angular momentum. But the best way to understand this is an example of a spinning ice skater. The ice skater starts a spin slowly with his or her arms out. And as the arms are brought in closer to the body, the spin gets faster and faster. Now, spinning objects tend to get flung out away from the axis of rotation. So now the cloud of gas and dust is spinning faster and faster and flattening into a disk called a protoplanetary disk. Most of the material coalesces towards the center, forming the protosun, while continuing to increase in pressure and temperature. In the meantime, the material in the outer edge of the disk coalesces and clumps together to form planetesimals, protoplanets, and eventually planets. When the mass, temperature, and pressure in the protosun is high enough for nuclear fusion to begin, the sun is born. The resulting blast of solar wind and radiation sweeps through the newly formed system, clearing out most of the remaining dust, and what remains is a fully formed solar system, with all the planets revolving in the same direction 
and approximately on the same plane around the central sun. So planets have motions associated with their formation. The two main motions are revolution around the sun and rotation about their axis. Now we saw that planets were formed by the same rotating cloud of gas and dust as the sun. So they all revolve around the sun in the same direction. And since they were formed by the same rotating nebula and protoplanetary disk, their orbits are all in approximately the same plane. Their orbits are elliptical, not circular. And they follow Kepler's laws of planetary motion, which we will not cover in this lecture. As mentioned, the other motion is rotation about their axis. All planets rotate about an inclined axis of rotation. Most planets are inclined somewhere between 0, a little over 0, and 28 degrees. But there are two special cases. Uranus has an axis of inclination of 98 degrees, so it sort of rolls along in its orbit. And Venus's axial tilt is 177 degrees, so it is basically upside down. All other planets rotate counterclockwise as viewed from the North Celestial Pole, but Venus rotates clockwise. Here are the planets and their orbits. As already mentioned, all planets revolve around the Sun in the same direction and approximately on the same plane. Now please note that the orbits and motion are not to scale. As the planets orbit the Sun, you'll notice that the closer the planet is to the Sun, the faster its orbital speed. This is due to the decreasing force of gravity as the distance from the Sun increases. For example, Mercury, the closest planet to the Sun, its orbital period is 88 Earth days, while Neptune, the farthest planet from the Sun, takes 165 years to complete one revolution around the Sun. Also notice that occasionally two or more planets align with each other. These alignments are called conjunctions. And finally, as an inner planet catches up and passes an outer planet, the outer planet will appear to stop and go backward for a while, as viewed against the background of stars, and then continue its forward progress. This is called apparent retrograde motion of planets, and it is simply an optical effect. Now before we look at each individual planet, let's cover some general characteristics. Planets are generally divided into two groups. Here we see the terrestrial planets. They are called terrestrial because they are Earth-like in many characteristics. They are formed from the high-density material near the center of the solar nebula, or the material that is closest to the Sun. They are relatively small and very dense. They all have an inner core, an iron core, and they are sometimes referred to as the inner planets. Here we have the Jovian planets, or Jupiter-like planets. Earth is included in the corner for size comparison. Unlike terrestrial planets, the Jovian planets formed from the low-density materials that were flung far out towards the outer edge of the solar nebula. Since they formed from the low-density material, they are all very large and gaseous. And they all have rings, although Saturn has the most prominent and famous ones. They are also referred to as the outer planets. Now we take a look at the individual planets. We start with Mercury, the closest planet to the Sun, and we'll move outward. Since Mercury is the innermost planet, it is also the fastest moving planet. And as such, it was named after the swift-footed Roman messenger god, Mercurius. Mercury is not only the closest planet to the Sun, it is also the smallest of the eight planets. It is less than half the diameter of Earth and about the same size as our Moon. This is a beautiful image taken from the messenger spacecraft. And as you can see, the surface is heavily cratered and is similar to our Moon's surface. 
the heavily cratered surface is usually an indication of a very old and geologically dead surface, but we'll see that a recent discovery suggests otherwise. Similar to Earth, Mercury has a solid iron core surrounded by a partially molten and liquid outer core and a solid outer shell or crust called a mantle. Being so close to the sun, Mercury essentially has no atmosphere. This is a color enhanced image to better contrast the surface features. Here we see the most dramatic of Mercury's surface features called the Caloris Impact Basin, one of the largest impact basins in the solar system. Mercury has a very slow and unique rotation. It is tidally locked with the Sun in a 3 to 2 spin orbit resonance, meaning that it rotates on its axis exactly three times for every two revolutions around the Sun. This translates to a day-night cycle of 176 Earth days, or daytime lasts 88 Earth days and nighttime lasts 88 Earth days. Because of this and the lack of an atmosphere to equalize the temperatures, there is a huge temperature range, 840 degrees Fahrenheit by day and minus 290 degrees Fahrenheit by night. Now, Mercury's orbit doesn't exactly follow Newtonian classical mechanics. Specifically, Mercury's perihelion, or its closest point to the Sun, precesses around the Sun in a manner that deviates from classical mechanics. This was first noticed in the mid-19th century by the French mathematician Le Verrier. And to explain this deviation, he proposed the existence of a small planet, which he called Vulcan, orbiting between Mercury and the Sun, whose gravitational influence would cause the deviation. Unfortunately, the planet was never found. It was not until the early 20th century that the effect was explained by Einstein's general theory of relativity. Now, for the Trekkies out there, this is not Spock's home world. In Star Trek, Vulcan is a fictional exoplanet of the star 40 Eridani A, which is about 16 light years from Earth. The first spacecraft to, mission, to visit Mercury was Mariner 10 from 1973 to 1975. Its mission was to measure Mercury's environment, atmosphere, surface, and body characteristics. During its three flybys, it was able to map about 45% of the surface. It discovered Mercury's very tenuous atmosphere, consisting mainly of helium, as well as discovering its very weak magnetic field. It also discovered Mercury's large, iron-rich core. The next spacecraft to visit Mercury was MESSENGER, launched in 2004. In 2011, it became the first spacecraft to orbit Mercury. It completed 100% mapping of the planet's surface. Among some of its key discoveries were water, ice, and organic compounds at the planet's north pole, and evidence of a large liquid iron outer core. Data collected in the last months of the MESSENGER mission suggests that Mercury is still contracting. In other words, it is still geologically active, making it the only planet besides Earth that is tectonically active. In April of 2015, MESSENGER ran out of propellant and deorbited as planned, crashing into Mercury's surface. The next explorer is BepiColombo, a joint European and Japanese mission. It was launched in 2018 and will settle into orbit in 2025. BepiColombo comprises two spacecraft with much more sophisticated instruments than MESSENGER, so we expect to learn much more about the planet. The next planet is Venus. Venus is sometimes called the morning or evening star. Of course, it is not a star, but it appears that way to the naked eye. Venus is the third brightest object in the sky, after the sun and the moon. It is so bright because it is surrounded by thick clouds that reflect most of the sunlight. 
Venus is named after the Roman god of love and beauty, probably because it was the brightest and most beautiful of the five known planets known to ancient astronomers. It is the only planet in the solar system to have a female name. Venus is the closest planet to Earth and is about the same size. And because it also has clouds and an atmosphere, it was thought to be possibly a sister planet to Earth. But it turns out not to be the case at all. It is true that Venus has an atmosphere, but it turns out to be 96% carbon dioxide. The atmosphere is so thick that the atmospheric pressure at the surface is 90 times that of Earth. The atmosphere acts like a blanket, trapping the emitted radiation from the surface of Venus. And this causes surface temperatures over 900 degrees Fahrenheit. That's hotter than Mercury's daytime side and hot enough to melt lead. Radar maps of the surface of Venus reveal a relatively low, rolling terrain dotted with mountains, craters, and volcanoes. Now these are computer-generated images from the data gathered by the Magellan spacecraft. Now because Venus's orbit is between the Earth and the Sun, it goes through phases similar to the Moon. And just like with lunar phases, we only see a portion of the illuminated side of Venus. If viewed with a small telescope, Venus often looks like a tiny moon. As we've already seen, Venus undergoes a retrograde rotation with an axial tilt of 177 degrees. So basically, Venus rotates upside down with respect to the other planets. Among the rarest of predictable astronomical events is the transit of Venus. A transit occurs when Venus passes between the Earth and the Sun and their orbital planes intersect. These are two pictures of the transit taken by the Solar Dynamics Observatory. Two different filters were used. During a transit, Venus appears as a small black dot moving across the face of the Sun. The last transit occurred in June of 2012. And this is the path of the total transit which took about six hours. Now, if you did not get a chance to see this event, it is unfortunate, because the next transit will not occur until December 10th, 2117. There have been many space missions to Venus, and I will highlight just a few. The first were the Soviet Venera missions. However, the first missions were unsuccessful. The first successful mission to Venus was the American Mariner 2 in 1962. It was the first spacecraft to successfully fly by another planet. It established that Venus has practically no magnetic field and measured the atmospheric temperature to be approximately 930 degrees Fahrenheit. The first successful Soviet mission was Venera 7 in 1970 and it became the first probe to successfully land on the surface of Venus, making it the first man-made spacecraft to land on another planet and send back signals to Earth. It relayed surface temperatures of around 880 degrees Fahrenheit. Magellan was launched in 1989 from the space shuttle Atlantis. This was the first interplanetary probe to be launched from the shuttle. Its primary mission was to map the surface of Venus and study its features. Magellan provided the first high-resolution map of 98% of the surface. These are still the best images we have today. It also greatly improved our understanding of the geology of Venus. The scarcity of impact craters suggests that the surface is relatively young, and there are lava channels thousands of kilometers long. More recently, the European Space Agency's Venus Express arrived in orbit in 2006 to study long-term atmospheric dynamics. One of the results emerging from this data is the evidence of past oceans. The current probe in orbit is the Japanese Akatsuki. Its mission is to study the atmosphere and meteorology of Venus. It entered orbit in December of 2015 and is on a current extended mission planned for the end of 2020. 
Earth is the third planet from the Sun and the largest of the terrestrial planets. We will just take a very brief look at Earth from a basic planetary perspective. As all the other planets, Earth moves within the solar system. Earth's axis is inclined by 23.4 degrees. This is what gives us our seasons. One complete rotation about its axis takes 24 hours and is the definition of our day. And the Earth takes 365 and a quarter days to complete one revolution around the sun. The extra quarter day is why we have a leap year every four years. Now you might notice that it is not exactly one quarter day. But not to worry, the slight difference is accounted for in our calendar by eliminating three days over a 400 year period. Now Earth is unique among all the other planets in that it has abundant surface water. 70% of the Earth's surface is covered by water. Earth's atmosphere is a thin layer of gas that surrounds the Earth and plays an important part in protecting and sustaining life. The atmosphere is very thin and stretches out about 50 to 60 miles above the surface. It is divided into three basic regions. The troposphere goes out about 11 miles from the surface. The stratosphere goes out about 30 miles from the surface. And the mesosphere goes out about 52 miles from the surface. And there are also boundary layers between the regions. We, of course, live in the troposphere. The air we breathe is 78% nitrogen and 21% oxygen. The remaining 1% is argon and carbon dioxide. And most of our weather, of course, also happens in the troposphere. The ozone layer is found in the stratosphere. This thin layer of gas helps to shield the planet from harmful ultraviolet radiation from the sun. Now, the atmosphere plays a critical role in keeping the Earth warm and reducing the temperature extremes between day and night. Gases in the atmosphere prevent some of the surface heat from radiating back into space. This is called the greenhouse effect. So the greenhouse effect is a good thing, and without it, life on Earth as we know it would not be possible. The way we learn about the internal structure of the Earth is by studying seismic waves as they travel through Earth. At the center, we have a solid iron inner core that is surrounded by a liquid iron outer core. And the partially molten, semi-solid rock mantle surrounds the core. And finally, a very thin crust that floats on the mantle. The movement of the crust over the mantle is what gives rise to plate tectonics, which continues to mold the surface of the Earth, giving rise to continental drifts, seafloor spreading, volcanic activity, and mountain formation. The prime example of continental drift are the land masses of South America and Africa. They look like two pieces of a puzzle that were once together and then slowly drifted apart. The internal temperature of the Earth increases with depth. It goes from approximately 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit at the upper mantle to 11,000 degrees Fahrenheit in the core. Now, most of the internal heat comes from the decay of naturally radioactive elements. And some of the heat also comes from the heat impact and compression when the Earth was forming. Earth has a magnetic field that protects it from charged solar wind particles. The magnetic field is also very useful for navigation as the magnetic poles are very close to the geographic poles. It is generated by the motion of molten iron alloys in the Earth's outer core. The magnetic field it produces is as if there were a huge bar magnet inside the Earth. And the field lines show the direction of the field and its strength. Now you probably recall from back in your school days when placing metal shavings by a bar magnet. They align themselves along the magnetic field lines. As you can see, the magnetic field is strongest by the poles and weaker by where the lines are far apart. Similarly, you can see that the Earth's magnetic field is strongest at the poles 
and weaker where the lines are far apart. Here you can also see that the field lines are coming out of the South Pole and going into the North Pole. At random intervals, on an average of several hundreds of thousands of years, the magnetic field reverses itself. The cause of the reversal is not known. The last reversal was 700,000 years ago, so we are in the window. When the field does reverse, it will not happen as evenly as this animation just showed. It will actually be very chaotic, setting up multiple magnetic poles throughout Earth as it's reversing. The magnetic field will weaken as it reverses, so the Earth will be less protected from the harmful solar radiation. It will not be a pretty time to be on Earth. Now let's take a brief look at our only natural satellite, the Moon. Here are some basic lunar data. The Moon is about the same age of the Earth, 4.5 billion years old. Its diameter is about a quarter that of the Earth, although its mass is only 1% of the Earth's. Its distance from Earth is about 240,000 miles. Now how was the Moon formed? Well, there are a few theories, which means we really don't know. But the most dominant theory seems to be the giant impact theory. According to this theory, shortly after the Earth formed, a large body, possibly the size of Mars, collided with the Earth, melting the surface rocks. The Moon then formed from the debris from the collision. In other words, it formed from the ejected molten rock from the impact. This also explains why the composition of the Moon is similar to the Earth's crust and the collision may also have given Earth its axial tilt. The Moon is in what is called synchronous rotation. This means that the time it takes to revolve around the Earth, called its orbital period, is the same time it takes to complete one rotation about its own axis. And this is why we always see the same face of the Moon. The side that we see from Earth is called the near side. The surface of the Moon is characterized by impact craters and maria, or seas, which are actually lava-filled craters. Maria is the plural of the Latin mare, which means sea. Early astronomers mistook these for actual seas. And although we cannot see the far side of the Moon from Earth, it has been photographed from space. We can see that it is much more heavily cratered than the near side. Now, is there water on the Moon? Well, liquid water cannot persist on the Moon's surface because it would evaporate due to the lack of a lunar atmosphere. However, since the 1960s, scientists have conjectured that water ice could survive on the surface. In August of 2018, water ice was in fact confirmed to exist. This image shows the distribution of the water ice at the Moon's south pole. The ice is concentrated in the very dark and cold craters and could possibly be very ancient. Although water was suspected since 2009, this is the first time scientists have directly observed definitive evidence of water ice on the Moon's surface. The recent confirmation was made by NASA scientists by analyzing data from the Moon Mineralogy, Mineralogy Mapper instrument aboard the Chandrayaan-1 spacecraft launched in 2008 by the Indian Space Research Organization. Now, with enough ice sitting at the surface, water could possibly be accessible as a resource for future expeditions and explorations. In December of 2017, NASA was given a new direction to refocus exploration efforts on the Moon with an eye to eventually going to Mars and beyond. The policy states in part, the United States will lead the return to the Moon for long-term exploration and utilization, followed by human missions to Mars and other destinations. Learning more about this recently discovered ice will be a key mission focus for NASA and our commercial partners as we endeavor to return to and explore the Moon. Mars is the last of the terrestrial planets. And as you can see, it is about half the size of Earth. Mars was named after the Roman god of war, 
possibly because its reddish color was reminiscent of blood. The color actually comes from the iron oxide or rust on the surface. A part of the fascination with Mars was fueled by a report in 1877 by the Italian astronomer Giovanni Schiaparelli that he had seen canali on Mars. Now properly translated, canali means channels which are produced by nature. But they were erroneously translated as canals, which implies man-made. Now this fueled a huge public fascination with Mars. The famous astronomer Percival Lowell was among the first to envision and extensively write about intelligent civilizations on Mars. And this inspired many works of science fiction, starting most famously with The War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells in 1898, and its 1938 radio broadcast by Orson Welles, which fooled a lot of people into thinking we were actually being invaded by aliens. With the advances in telescopes, it became clear that Mars is actually a very inhospitable planet. Nevertheless, a series of spacecraft explorers and rovers have been sent to Mars to collect data to determine if conditions on Mars can support life. From various missions, we know that the surface on Mars is like a rocky desert. Its rusty reddish color is due to iron oxide. This is a picture of this rover Sojourner on the surface of Mars taking a sample from Yogi, the large rock. The picture was taken by the stationary Pathfinder lander in 1997. Now a striking feature on the surface is Olympus Mons. It is an extinct volcano and is the highest planetary mountain and the second highest mountain in the solar system. It is two and a half times as high as Mount Everest and as wide as Colorado. Another striking feature on the surface of Mars is the Valles Marinares or the Mariner Valley. It cuts across the face of Mars and is one of the largest canyons in the solar system. It is 10 times longer five times deeper, and 20 times wider than the Grand Canyon. It was discovered on a flyby by the Mariner 9 spacecraft in the early 70s. Its origin is unknown, although a leading hypothesis holds that it started as a crack billions of years ago as the planet cooled. Mars has polar ice caps. The north has a water ice cap, and the south has a frozen carbon dioxide, or a dry ice cap. Under the dry ice cap, there is a water ice cap as well. Just like Earth, the axial tilt causes seasons on the planet, and the ice caps grow and sink with the Martian seasons. It is believed that Mars once had an atmosphere able to sustain a warmer climate and surface water. And for reasons that we don't know yet, Mars did not retain its atmosphere, but dried out and cooled. Today, Mars has a very thin atmosphere, so thin that the atmospheric surface pressure is only 1% that of Earth. The atmosphere is mainly carbon dioxide. The thin atmosphere makes for a very cold, average surface temperature. So to paraphrase Goldilocks, Venus is too hot, Mars is too cold, and Earth is just right. The question of the presence of water on Mars, both past and present, has always been of great interest. The present form of water on Mars today is either in the form of ice or the recently discovered subsurface liquid water. So we start with the water ice. The only place where water ice is visible at the surface is at the north polar cap. There is also abundant water ice beneath the carbon dioxide ice cap at the south polar cap. In 2016, NASA reported finding a large area of underground ice equivalent in volume to Lake Superior. In July of 2018, the European Space Agency announced the discovery of an underground liquid water lake near Mars's southern ice cap. And in 2020, additional underground lakes were discovered. Now data suggests that in the very distant past, 
about three billion years ago, surface water was abundant. Geological evidence of past water is supported by surface features such as outflow channels, valley networks, deltas, and lake beds. This is an artist's impression of what ancient Mars may have looked like. Understanding water on Mars is vital to assess the planet's potential for harboring life and providing resources for human, future human exploration. Now, although there is no evidence of an advanced Martian civilization, the question still remains as to whether any form of life ever emerged on Mars. And the answer to this question has been the driving force behind Mars's exploration. Since 1960, space agencies from various countries have launched 45 missions to Mars. Of those 45 missions, 21 have failed entirely including the NASA Mars Climate Orbiter that crashed on the surface in 1999 due to a metric imperial unit mix-up. Six missions were partially successful and 18 were successful missions. A few of the most successful NASA missions include Mariner 4, which was the first successful flyby, returning 21 images of the planet. Mariner 9 was the first spacecraft to successfully enter orbit around Mars. And Viking 1 and 2 were the first two successful missions on the surface. Their missions lasted six and four years, respectively. And actually, the Russian Mars 3 was the first to successfully land on Mars, but it ceased transmission within 15 seconds. The Pathfinder mission was the first to deploy a rover, making Sojourner the first rover on Mars. The Spirit and Opportunity rovers landed on the surface in 2004. Spirit ceased transmitting in 2011, while Opportunity continued operating until 2018. Their original missions were 92 days. Opportunity exceeded its operating plan by 14 years. We will talk more about the Curiosity rover in the next slide. Mars continues to be of interest specifically with studying its future habitability potential. There are currently six planned missions, three of which are NASA's, including the Mars 2020 rover, which we will see in a couple of slides, and 20 or so future proposals are under study. Now, before leaving Mars, I'd like to say a few words about the two current rovers. Curiosity landed in the Gale Crater on Mars in August of 2012. Here we see Curiosity's selfie at Mount Sharp. Its main scientific goal is to determine the habitability of Mars, both past and future. And to achieve this, Curiosity will try to determine if Mars could have supported life in any form. It will study the climate and geology of Mars and help prepare for future human explorations of Mars, possibly in the 2030s. This is a beautiful panorama taken by Curiosity of what is known as the Kimberley Formation. The strata in the foreground tip towards the base of Mount Sharp, indicating flow of water toward a basin. This shows that billions of years ago, three to four billion years ago, Mars was capable of storing water in lakes. The Mars 2020 rover, named Perseverance, was launched on July 30th, 2020, and is scheduled to land on the planet on February 18th, 2021. Its mission will be to search for signs of ancient microbial life, which will advance NASA's quest to explore the past habitability of Mars. It will also collect samples of Martian rock and soil and then store them in sealed tubes for pickup by a future mission that would then ferry them back to Earth for detailed analysis. And it will test technologies to help pave the way for future human exploration of Mars. Now strapped to the rover's belly and hitching a ride on the journey to Mars is the Mars Helicopter Ingenuity. The Mars Helicopter is a technology demonstration 
to test powered flight on another planet for the first time. We now move to the Jovian planets, the first of which is Jupiter. Being the biggest planet, Jupiter is named after the king of the ancient Roman gods and it dominates the other planets. As mentioned, Jupiter is the largest planet in the solar system and is 11 times the diameter of Earth. And its mass is more than twice that of all the other planets combined. Now despite its size, Jupiter has a very rapid rotation and has the shortest day of all the planets, taking only 10 hours to rotate about its axis. Now remember, Earth takes 24 hours and is much smaller. So this rapid rotation causes Jupiter to appear somewhat squashed. Its axial tilt is only three degrees with respect to its orbital plane, so it spins nearly upright and does not have pronounced seasons. Jupiter makes one complete orbit around the Sun in about 12 Earth years. Its average distance to the Sun is about a half a billion miles. Now, to date, Jupiter has 79 moons, 53 of which are confirmed, and 26 are still provisional. The four largest moons are called the Galilean satellites in honor of Galileo, who discovered them in 1610. Jupiter is perpetually covered by a cloudy atmosphere. The cloud layer is about 44 miles deep and likely has three distinct layers with various ice, crystals, and vapors. The colorful bands seen parallel to the equator are called zones and belts. Zones are the lighter colored bands, while belts are the darker ones. The different colors are caused by different compositions of gases and by the rising and sinking of gases within convection cells. The interactions of these circulation patterns cause storms and turbulence. The ripple patterns that we see is turbulence, while the ovals are storms. The most famous storm is Jupiter's great red spot. And here is a cutout of the area. It is about twice as wide as Earth and has persisted for centuries. It is the most prominent feature on Jupiter, and it's basically just a giant hurricane that changes color and size over time. Now, Juno's first Passover in July of 2017 measured the storm to be 200 miles deep and has shrunk to about 1.5 times the diameter of Earth. And this storm has been tracked since its discovery in 1831. Now, Jupiter is considered a gas giant, as are the other Jovian planets. Gas giants are made from the lighter material that was flung out to the outer edge of the solar nebula during the formation of the solar system. Now, Jupiter does not have a true solid surface like the terrestrial planets have. In fact, the Jupiter is somewhat like the Sun. It is made up mostly of hydrogen and helium. It is thought that Jupiter has a small, solid, rocky core. The core is surrounded by highly compressed gases, first of liquid, a layer of liquid metallic hydrogen, then a layer of liquid hydrogen and helium. Now, although to a much lesser extent than Saturn, Jupiter also has rings. This is an infrared image taken by the Hubble Space Telescope in 1997, showing a very tenuous ring. And this is a closer look at the rings from the Galileo spacecraft. These rings are very thin and are mostly made up of dust particles. Now, as already mentioned, Jupiter's four main moons are called the Galilean satellites in honor of Galileo, who discovered them in 1610. Their orbits all lie along Jupiter's equatorial plane, and they are easily seen through a small telescope. The innermost moon is Io. It is easily the most geologically active body in the solar system. The volcanic activity is caused by its heating mechanism. The gravitational pull between Io and Jupiter causes extreme tidal forces that stretch and squeeze Io. This tidal friction causes Io's interior to heat up in a process known as tidal heating. There are over 400 active volcanoes on Io. 
the volcanic plumes of sulfur and sulfur compounds give it its yellowish color. The next moon is Europa. Europa has a very smooth, icy surface with visible fractures that make it look like a frozen lake. It is thought that below the icy surface is a vast, slushy ocean. In 2012, Hubble detected what might be water plumes erupting from Europa's South Pole. And in May of 2018, scientists provided supporting evidence of water plumes. Now this would be a, provide a way for sampling Europa's subsurface ocean. And we all know that wherever there is water, there is a chance of microbial life. In fact, Europa is one of the top locations to look for extraterrestrial life in the solar system. Ganymede is the largest moon in the solar system. It is actually larger than Mercury. Now, there is no evidence of any recent geological activity. And recent data from the Hubble Space Telescope suggests that there may be an ocean of water under its icy crust. Callisto is the last of the Galilean satellites and is possibly the oldest surface in the solar system with impact basins dating back four billion years. The Valhalla Crater is the largest multi-ring impact crater in the solar system. The inner bright region is about 22 miles, 220 miles across, while the concentric rings extend to about 1,200 miles. Now, many spacecraft have gone to Jupiter. We start by looking at the flyby missions first. The first spacecraft to fly by Jupiter were Pioneer 10 and 11 in the early 1970s. They obtained the first ever close-up images of Jupiter and the Galilean satellites, studied its atmosphere, detected a magnetic field, and provided the first close-up images of the Great Red Spot. The next spacecraft were Voyager 1 and 2 in the late 70s. The Voyager missions transformed our view of Jupiter and gave us the first fantastic photos of the planet. Voyager discovered the rings of Jupiter and observed active volcanoes on Io. This was the first time an active volcano was observed on a celestial body other than Earth. The next spacecraft was Cassini, which flew by Jupiter in 2000 on its way to Saturn. During its flyby, it provided some of the highest resolution images ever taken of the planet and made detailed observations of Jupiter's atmospheric circulation. The New Horizons spacecraft flew by Jupiter in 2007 on its way to Pluto and the Kuiper Belt. In addition to receiving a gravitational assist from Jupiter, it studied the Galilean satellites, Jupiter's magnetosphere, and its tenuous ring system. Next, we have the orbiter missions. The first is the Galileo spacecraft. It was launched and delivered into Earth orbit in 1989 by the space shuttle Atlantis and entered Jupiter's orbit in 1995. It was the first spacecraft to orbit Jupiter and stayed in orbit until 2003. At the end of its mission, it was destroyed doing a controlled impact with Jupiter. During this period, it gathered a large amount of data and conducted an in-depth study of the Jovian system. The spacecraft was composed of an orbiter and an atmospheric entry probe, which became the first probe directly launched into Jupiter and directly measuring its atmosphere. Some of the key findings of the mission include the first observation of ammonia in the atmosphere, mapping the extent and structure of the magnetosphere, confirming active volcanism on Io, and providing supporting evidence of a liquid subsurface ocean on Europa. Juno is the current NASA mission to Jupiter. It was launched in August of 2011 and entered orbit in July of 2016. Its mission is to study Jupiter's composition, its gravity field, and its magnetic field. And additionally, Juno is searching to understand the origin and evolution of the planet, determine its mass distribution, look for a solid planetary core, and measure water and ammonia in the deep atmosphere. Juno's mission has been extended to July 2021, 
and after completing its mission, it will intentionally deorbit into Jupiter's atmosphere. Saturn was the most distant planet known to ancient astronomers. It is probably the most beautiful and recognizable of all the planets. It is named after the Roman god Saturnos, god of wealth and agriculture. It is the second largest planet in the solar system and is nine times the diameter of Earth. Saturn's density is the lowest of all planets, around 70% the density of water. If you had an ocean large and deep enough, Saturn would actually float on it. Saturn is a lot like Jupiter. It is a gas giant with no solid surface. It has a rapid rotation, giving it somewhat a squashed appearance. It has a cloudy atmosphere with bands similar to Jupiter, although not as dramatic and colorful. Its internal structure is also similar to Jupiter. It is thought to have a solid rocky core surrounded by a deep layer of liquid metallic hydrogen and followed by a layer of liquid hydrogen and helium. Of course, the most interesting and distinctive feature of Saturn is its magnificent rings. This very detailed image was taken by the Cassini spacecraft in 2004. The rings were first observed by Galileo in 1610, but he was unable to identify them as rings. They appeared as bulges, which he once called the ears of Saturn. In 1656, as telescopes got better, the Dutch astronomer, physicist, and mathematician Christian Huygens was the first person to suggest that Saturn was surrounded by a thin, flat ring. And about 20 years later, as telescopic resolution continued to improve, the Italian astronomer Giovanni Cassini determined that the ring was actually composed of smaller rings with gaps between them. The largest of these gaps was later called the Cassini division. The physical structure of the rings was discovered by the Voyager spacecraft in 1980. They are made of highly reflective particles, mostly water, ice, and some rock, ranging in size from small particles to pieces the size of a house. In this image, we can clearly see two rings, the A ring, the B ring, and they're separated by the Cassini division. There are currently two theories on the formation of the ring system. One is that the rings were previously a moon that was then pulled apart by gravity, or they were particles and rocks left over from Saturn's birth that never formed into a moon. Now, because of Saturn's axial tilt, we get different views of the rings as seen from Earth. This was taken by the Hubble Space Telescope in 1996 when the rings were almost edge on. And this was taken in 2003 with the face-on view of the rings. Saturn has 82 confirmed moons. The largest moon is Titan. It is actually larger than Mercury. Now, Titan has a very thick nitrogen-methane atmosphere similar to that of primordial Earth. So that makes Titan very interesting. This is an image taken by the Cassini spacecraft in 2009 showing Titan in its natural color. Now this image is processed to remove Titan's hazy atmosphere. One of the most interesting discoveries of the Cassini-Huygens mission is that Titan has liquid hydrocarbon lakes near its polar regions, making it the only other body in the solar system with surface liquid. It is also thought that Titan has a subsurface ocean of liquid water. Because of the surface liquid and the subsurface ocean, Titan is thought to be a possible host for microbial extraterrestrial life. Enceladus is another interesting moon of Saturn. It has a highly reflective icy surface. In 2005, the Cassini mission found jets of water vapor coming from its south pole. And in June of 2018, Analysis from the Cassini data indicates the presence of organic molecules within these jets. Studies of these watery geysers show that they originate from a body of subsurface liquid water. And where there is water, there could be primitive microbial life. 
So both Titan and Enceladus are worthy of much greater study. There have been four spacecraft missions to Saturn. The first was a flyby by Pioneer 11 in 1979, providing the first close-up, albeit low-resolution, images of the planet. The next two missions were flybys by Voyager 1 and 2, and these provided the first high-resolution res images of the planet and its rings, revealing new details about the ring system. But it wasn't until the Cassini-Huygens mission that we started to learn about the planet in greater detail. It was launched in 1997 and entered orbit in 2004, becoming the first spacecraft to orbit Saturn. The spacecraft was a two-part system. Cassini was the NASA orbiter and Huygens the European Space Agency's probe. And it was released from Cassini in December 2004 and landed three weeks later on Saturn's moon Titan. This was the first probe to land on an outer solar system body. Some of the key findings includes accurately measuring Saturn's rotational period and studying its dynamic atmosphere. And besides providing us with wonderful images of the rings, it measured the size distribution of particles in the rings. Among some of the other discoveries are seven new moons, evidence of a large salty internal ocean of liquid water in Enceladus, and the discovery of large liquid hydrocarbon lakes on Titan. This is the first discovery of current lakes anywhere in the solar system besides Earth. In 2017, Cassini ended its mission in a grand finale descent as it flew through Saturn's rings and finally plunged into Saturn's atmosphere. Now, although Cassini's mission has ended, the analysis of the return data during its grand finale descent will continue for many years. Now, the discovery of Uranus in 1781 by William Herschel marks a new era in astronomy. It was the first planet to be discovered with a telescope. Uranus is the third largest planet with a diameter of about four times that of Earth. It is named after the Greek god of the sky. Now, Uranus is covered in methane clouds that absorb red light and reflect blue, therefore giving it its bluish-green appearance. Perhaps its most unusual characteristic is that its axis of rotation is tilted 98 degrees with respect to its orbital plane. And here we see Earth's axis is close to perpendicular as all the other planets, but Uranus is almost parallel, so it sort of rolls along its orbital plane. Now because of this, it is known as the sideways planet. Now although Uranus is one of the gas giants as Jupiter and Saturn, it is also called an ice giant because of its icy internal structure. At the center, we have a rocky core surrounded by a mantle of water, ammonia, and methane ices, followed by an outer layer of hydrogen, helium, and methane gases. Now, although not as beautiful as Saturn's rings, Uranus also has a ring system. They were unexpectedly discovered in 1977 during ground-based observations. They were seen in the data, not directly observed. But it wasn't until Voyager's flyby in 1986 that their presence was confirmed. And in 2005, the Hubble Space Telescope found new rings. Uranus has 27 known moons. All of the moons are named after magical spirit characters from the works of William Shakespeare and Alexander Pope. Probably the most interesting moon is Miranda. With its patchwork surface structure, it looks like it was just sort of pieced together. Now, perhaps this moon should have been named after Mary Shelley's character, Frankenstein. And scientists still disagree on what caused this surface. Neptune is the eighth and most distant planet in the solar system. It is named after the Roman god of the sea. Neptune was discovered in 1846 and is the first planet discovered based on the theoretical prediction of its existence. More on the amazing story of its discovery in the next slide. 
As the other gas giants, Neptune is mostly hydrogen and helium with an outer layer of methane, which gives it its bluish appearance. Although the atmosphere is similar to Uranus, Neptune is stormier. This 1989 image taken by Voyager 2 shows Neptune's great dark spot, a huge storm that had disappeared five years later when imaged by the Hubble Space Telescope, although Hubble found another storm indicating a very active atmosphere. Neptune's internal structure is very similar to Uranus and is also called a nice giant. A rocky core surrounded by a mantle of water, ammonia, and methane ices, and followed by an atmosphere of hydrogen, helium, and methane gases. Neptune has 14 known moons, of which Triton is the most significant. The most interesting fact about Triton is that it has a retrograde orbit. In other words, it moves in the opposite direction to Neptune. Triton was probably another body that was captured by Neptune's gravity. So let's take a quick look at Neptune's wonderful discovery and how it relates to the hypothetical planet X. The amazing story of Neptune's discovery starts with the discovery of Uranus. Shortly after Uranus was discovered in 1781, astronomers started to notice anomalies in its predicted orbit. To explain this, the French mathematician Le Verrier predicted the existence of an unseen planet beyond Uranus whose gravitational influence would cause the orbital perturbations. Based on Newton's law of universal gravitation, they calculated the position of the predicted planet, pointed their telescopes, and lo and behold, the new planet was found. So how does this relate to the hypothetical planet X? Well, some of the smaller Kuiper belt objects have very unique and unusual orbits. Based on detailed mathematical modeling and computer simulations, scientists have predicted the existence of a body far beyond Pluto and about 20 times the mass of Earth, whose gravitational influence could explain the orbital anomalies. Unfortunately, this body, if it exists, would be very far away and therefore extremely faint and hard to detect so its potential discovery is very challenging. Now let's move on to dwarf planets. Dwarf planets are a new category of solar system objects introduced in 2006 by the International Astronomical Union. Pluto is now classified as one of these bodies. Pluto was discovered in 1930 by the American astronomer Clyde Tombaugh and until the official classification was considered the ninth planet. Now, by definition, Pluto was classified as a dwarf planet in 2006 because it had not cleared the or neighborhood of its orbit. Pluto is named after the Roman god of the underworld, and its name was suggested by an 11-year-old British schoolgirl. Pluto is very small, about one-sixth the size of Earth, and smaller than our moon. It is mostly made of rock and ice, very different from the four outer planets that are large and gaseous. Pluto's orbit is also very different from the other planets. As you can see, all the planets orbit the sun in nearly circular orbits and on relatively the same plane. But Pluto's orbit is much more inclined compared to the others and also more eccentric. On average, Pluto is 3.7 billion miles from the Sun and takes 248 years to complete one revolution around the Sun. In July 2015, the New Horizons spacecraft made its closest approach to Pluto, becoming the first and only spacecraft to do so. During its brief flyby, it made detailed measurements and observations of Pluto and its moons and provided us with the first ever close-up images of Pluto. An interesting surface feature of Pluto is a heart-shaped region called the Tombaugh Regio, almost 1,000 miles across, and consisting of two geologically distinct lobes. The smooth, the smooth lobe is called the Sputnik Planitia and is thought to be a large impact crater filled with nitrogen snow. 
Pluto has five moons. This is a beautiful color-enhanced image captured by New Horizons of Pluto and its largest moon, Charon. At about half the diameter of Pluto, Charon is the largest moon relative to its planet in the solar system. Pluto and Charon are sometimes referred to as a double planet. Data from New Horizons points to more prevalent water ice on Pluto's surface than was previously thought. This is a false color image showing where water ice is abundant and that it is considerably more widespread than previously known. New Horizons is currently on its way to the Kuiper Belt to explore how bodies on the outskirts of the solar system have evolved over time. Our next dwarf planet is Ceres discovered by the Italian astronomer, astronomer Giuseppe Piazzi in 1801, more than 100 years before Pluto. It lies between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter and is the largest body within the asteroid belt. When Ceres was first discovered, it was called a planet. But after the rapid discovery of similar objects, Ceres and the others were called asteroids. And in 2006, it was eventually classified as a dwarf planet. In January of 2014, emissions of water vapor were detected from several regions of Ceres, making Ceres a very exciting target for study. The Dawn spacecraft entered orbit around Ceres in March of 2015. Its mission to study the conditions and formation of the early solar system. An interesting feature discovered by Dawn is my mysterious bright spots on the surface. There are over 300 of these spots, and they are thought to be a type of highly reflective brine. Here is a close-up of Ocater, the largest impact crater on Ceres, which contains spot number five, the brightest of the bright spots. Another feature discovered by Dawn is Ceres' lon lonely mountain, Ahuna Mons, an enormous cryovolcano also known as an ice volcano, three miles high. In 2016, Dawn found definitive evidence of water molecules on the surface of Ceres. And in August of 2020, NASA confirmed that Ceres is an ocean world with an extensive reservoir of seawater beneath the surface. Eris was discovered in 2005. And here we see Eris with its only moon, Dysnomia, as seen by the Hubble Space Telescope. And this is a 3D model made by NASA. Now, at first, Eris was thought to be larger than Pluto. So this led to a controversy over Pluto's status at a planet. The main question after its discovery was, should Eris be the 10th planet? And if so, should other somewhat similar bodies also be added to the planet the list of planets. Astronomers were very much split on the issue, and it, it eventually led to a formal classification of solar system bodies by the International Astronomical Union in 2006. Pluto and Eris, along with other similar bodies, fell into the dwarf planet category. So Eris is very appropriately named after the Roman goddess of strife and discord. Now, it turns out that data from the New Horizons spacecraft shows that Pluto is actually larger than Eris, but Eris is more massive. Haumea is the fourth dwarf planet. It was discovered in 2004 beyond the orbit of Neptune. Haumea has two moons and a ring system. And Makimaki is our fifth dwarf planet. It was discovered in 2005 beyond, beyond the orbit of Haumea. It has one, one known moon and is the second brightest Kuiper Belt object after Pluto. Now, many more bodies have been discovered, and there is a long list of potential dwarf planet candidates. But there's also a very short list of nearly certain ones. And these are all beyond the orbit of Neptune, which brings us to our next topic. Trans-Neptunian objects. So trans-Neptunian objects are objects that are beyond Neptune and still orbit the Sun. They are believed to be debris 
left over from the formation of the solar system. And as such, they can tell us much about the origins of our solar system and how it evolves over time. Pluto is now the prototype trans-Neptunian object. 1992 QB1 was the first object found other than Pluto. And since then, over 1,000 trans-Neptunian objects have been found. So here are the 10 largest known TNOs. The top four are recognized as dwarf planets, while the bottom six are the nearly certain ones that we saw in the previous slide. Now, trans-Neptunian objects are further subdivided into objects within the Kuiper Belt, a donut-shaped region of icy objects extending beyond the orbit of Neptune. Scattered disk, a distant region sparsely populated by objects with extreme orbits. The dwarf planet Eris is a scattered disk object and the Oort cloud, a hypothesized spherical cloud from which comets originate. The Oort cloud extends to the far edge of the solar system, out to about 10 trillion miles. But before we talk about the faraway comets, let's go back closer to home and talk about asteroids. So asteroids are small, irregularly shaped inner solar system bodies mostly found in a region between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter, appropriately named the asteroid belt. They are small, rocky, and metallic bodies, ranging in size between 30 feet and 330 miles. The total mass of all of the objects in the asteroid belt is about 4% the mass of our moon. They are thought to be early solar system material that never formed into a planet and as such, they are considered messengers from the solar system's past. In other words, the substances they carry can provide answers about how our planet and our solar system formed. Now, collisions are a part of solar system life, and Earth is not immune. In our history, we've had a few major impacts and some near ones. In 2013, a 66-foot fragment of an asteroid entered the Earth's atmosphere over Russia, where it, it exploded with a force of 20 to 30 atomic bombs. Fortunately, it burned before reaching Earth, but the explosion injured over 1,000 people. In 1908, an asteroid about twice the size did impact Earth, flattening forests for thousands of miles in Siberia. And of course, 66 million years ago, an asteroid impact on the Yucatan Peninsula wiped out the dinosaurs. So history tells us that asteroid impacts are not only possible, but they are inevitable. Because of this possibility, there are various search programs to find and identify potentially hazardous asteroids. To date, they have identified over 1,600 of these asteroids. Fortunately, none of them are currently on a collision course with us so far. Here are a few well-known asteroids. As you can see, most are irregular in shape, except Vesta. They are not to scale, but I've added their dimensions to give you an idea of their size. Vesta has a mountain peak at its south pole that is three times the size of Mount Everest. This is the tallest mountain in the solar system. Also seen here is the Snowman Crater. And finally, we come to comets and the far reaches of our solar system. The word comet comes from the Greek aster kometis, or long-haired stars. Of course, they have nothing to do with stars, but you can see why they got their name. Comets are more like dirty snowballs that orbit the sun and evaporate as they pass close to the sun. As with asteroids, comets are messengers from the solar system's past. And as such, they can give us clues about the formation of the solar system. Some of the early solar system materials have been locked away in the icy core of comets, and their far-flung orbits have kept the sun from degrading these original building blocks. The substances they carry within their ice and rocks can help us answer questions about how our planet formed, where it got its water, 
and possibly even where it got its life. Scientists have known for quite some time that both comets and asteroids contain organic molecules, which are a key ingredient for the amino acids that make up life on Earth. The still unanswered question is whether such molecules could combine to form the more complex materials of life when they reach a planet's surface. There is still much to be learned from studying both asteroids and comets. The most distinguishing feature, of course, is the tail. So let's take a closer look. While comets are in the outer solar system, they remain frozen and are extremely hard to detect. Now, as the comet approaches the inner solar system, the solar radiation vaporizes the icy materials, and streams of gas and dust are released. The gas and dust is then pushed away by the radiation pressure and solar wind, causing the tails to form. As you can see from this close-up of Hale-Bopp, two tails are formed. The bluish tail is called the ion tail and is made up of ionized gases that glow or emit their own radiation. The dust tail is formed by dust particles that reflect sunlight and therefore are whitish in color. Now, as you can see, the two tails point in slightly different directions because of their different compositions. But you will notice that the tails always point away from the sun. And that is because it is the radiation pressure and solar wind that pushes the dust and gas away from the sun. Now let's look at the type of comets. Periodic comets have a period of less than 200 years. And here we see two periodic comets, Halley and Temple 1, with periods of 76 and 5.5 years, respectively. And these comets start off in the Kuiper belt. Then we have long period comets, such as Hale-Bopp with a 2,500 year period, and Hayukataki with a 17,000 year period. Now these comets originate in the Oort cloud. Both of these types are comets that are within our solar system and are bound to the sun. Now comets have also been detected outside of our solar system. These are called extrasolar comets or exocomets, and they are gravitationally bound to a star. The first exocomet was discovered in 1987, and there are a total of 11 stars around which exocomets have been observed. And lastly, we have interstellar comets. These comets are located in interstellar space and are not gravitationally bound to a star. The first and only interstellar comet so far was discovered in 2019. Now, meteor showers are connected to comets. Comets leave a trail of debris in their paths as they go through the solar system. When the Earth passes through that trail of debris, we get meteor showers. The most famous comet is Halley's Comet. It has been observed and recorded for over 2,000 years, but the observations were not recognized as the reappearance of the same object. In 1705, Edmund Halley recognized the recorded observations as the reappearance of the same object. He then determined its periodicity of 75 to 76 years and made the first prediction of its return. Now, although he did not live to witness the return, it did in fact return as he predicted in 1758. The last appearance of Halley's Comet was in 18, 1986, and the next will be in 2061. Now, as far as exploration, that honor goes to the Rosetta Orbiter and the Philae Lander. We start with the Rosetta Orbiter. It was built and launched by the European Space Agency in 2004. Now, this is Comet 67P, as imaged by Rosetta in 2014. This is not to scale. Rosetta is 100 feet wide, while the comet is about uh, 2.5 miles wide. Rosetta entered orbit around the comet in September of 2014, making it the first spacecraft to orbit a comet. Rosetta escorted the comet as it went around the sun. 
And as it continued to move away from the sun, it collected data until it made a controlled impact with the surface in September of 2016. It was designed to complete the most detailed study of a comet ever attempted. And one of the first findings was that the water vapor on the comet is significantly different from the Earth's oceans, delivering a blow to the theory that water on Earth uh, came from collisions with comets. On November 12, 2014, the Philae lander land launched from Rosetta and after a seven-hour journey landed on the comet. This is an artist's impression of the landing and here is the actual landing. Although it did successfully land on the comet, it bounced a couple of times before settling down and unfortunately the spot where it finally settled down was in a shady area and was not able to recharge its battery through its solar panels. It nevertheless achieved its mission to successfully land on the comet and to transmit back data from the surface until it shut down on November 14th. One of its findings is that the comet does not have a magnetic field. This is an important finding in that it tells us that magnetic fields were not strong in the early solar system. It also found organic compounds in the comet's gases, confirming findings from earlier mission. Now, it is absolutely amazing that we can launch a spacecraft on a 10-year journey to land on a comet that is 300 million miles away and only two and a half miles wide. We end this lecture with some beautiful images of recent great comets as seen from Earth. There is actually no official definition for a great comet. It is basically a comet that becomes exceptionally bright, as we see in these images. Now, great comets are pretty rare and appear about once a decade. So this ends today's lecture. I hope you've enjoyed learning a little bit more about our solar system bodies, and thank you for watching.